The U.S. Supreme Court wrapped up its 2014 session today, dealing blows to President Obama and organized labor. In Burwell versus Hobby Lobby stores, the court ruled that private employers can't be forced to provide contraceptive coverage if it violates their religious beliefs. And in Harris versus Quinn, the court determined that home health aides in Illinois can't be forced to pay union dues against their will. The Supreme Court justices start their summer break now, but the rulings they've handed down over the past few weeks will reverberate long after they return. The Supreme Court session that just ended feels especially significant, maybe because when they're taken collectively, the court's findings have a clear conservative thrust, politically and culturally. Among the losers, President Obama, the Affordable Care Act, and advocates of affirmative action, abortion rights, and technological innovation. The winners, meanwhile, include religious conservatives, the major TV networks, and opponents of organized labor. So how will the court's recent rulings resonate in the coming years? Here to offer some perspective is Kent Greenfield. He's a constitutional law expert and a professor at Boston College Law School. Kent, welcome back to Greater Boston. Continue. So you saw our attempt at a scorecard there. Do we get that generally right, or are we missing some, uh, some nuances? What's, what's interesting about this uh, term was that a lot of uh, parties won by losing. So, for example, the, the unions today lost the case in, of Harris v. Quinn, but they didn't lose it as much that, as most people thought they would. Okay, why not? So, the, the court just struck down the, uh, the forced payments in Illinois among health care workers, uh, home health care workers. So, it's a very narrow opinion. Most co court watchers, or many court watchers, including me, thought that they were going to strike down all public sector employees. And say basically and that, that employees of public sector unions can't be forced to pay right. union dues against their will. So we avoid, so those, the advocates for unions avoided that, that worst case scenario and lived to fight another day. Did that ruling, though, set the precedent for a more sweeping ruling down the road? That's a concern I've seen voiced. Today. Yes, it, but, but that's, that's already been mentioned in cases, so that, that, trend is there, but the court is still not able to get five votes to go there yet. Okay. Another example of that, I think, is, is, the, is the buffer zone case from last week. The most court watchers, including me, thought the court was going to strike down all buffer zones everywhere. But what it did was it wrote a pretty narrow opinion striking down Massachusetts buffer zone because it was an outlier. It was more, more protective than any other buffer zone in the country. So, for example, the Supreme Court still gets to have a buffer zone of their own, exactly. which is convenient. Right. 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 Uh, down the road, possibly, uh, will we see the whole buffer zone issue revisited and, the, you know, a full-scale elimination of buffer zones? Well, maybe, but uh, again, both part, both sides lived to fight another day, and it, was, and it wasn't as bad as many uh, abortion rights advocates fear. Let me ask you about the Hobby Lobby decision, right. and specifically about a point that Justice uh, Ginsburg made in her dissent. She said, uh, and I'm going to quote here, that the ruling could empower, quote, employers with religiously grounded objections to blood transfusions, Jehovah's Witnesses, antidepressants, that would be Scientologists, medications derived from pigs, including anesthesia, IV fluids, and pills coated with gelatin, certain Muslims, Jews, and Hindus. Are the ramifications as broad as Justice Ginsburg seems to think? Maybe. We, we, let, me, let me explain a little bit of what was going on with, in the Hobby Lobby case. Yeah, so please. The, the corporation is owned by a family very even very devout evangelical Christians so they think that some kinds of contraceptives are contrary to their religious beliefs and one provision of the Obamacare requires employers of a certain size to uh, to provide their employees health insurance that includes contraceptives so they sued and said look we shouldn't be a, be responsible for this provision in Obamacare we should get a religious exemption and the court today held that yes they should now the, the court said that it the, their opinion its opinions would only be limited to privately held or closely held corporations. And here's where the worry comes in that goes to your point, which is that most companies in America are closely held. They're not publicly mm -hmm. traded on one of the big stock exchanges, and that's what it means to be closely held. Some of the nation's largest employers, including Cargill, including Burger King, including uh, Coke in Industries of the oh, wow. Coke brothers, are privately held. And after today, they can say, they, they can claim the religious beliefs of their shareholders. Did that ruling also further this uh, sort of notion of corporate personhood that we've seen advanced in the recent past, including in the Citizens United case? Absolutely. So now, in Citizens United, in effect, the, it, the court said, for purposes of, for some purposes of the First Amendment, corporations get the First Amendment rights of persons. And today, they decided that uh, under the, the Re Religious Freedom Restoration Act, a statute that uses the word 
per persons. It includes corporations. And that was signed, by the way, by uh, then President Bill Clinton, correct? Right. Okay. So right. it's not. It's worth remembering that it wasn't a Republican president. Who signed Absolutely, it was a very it was a bipartisan bill, and that was one of the things that Ginsburg said in her dissent that if if it was so bipartisan, it should it, we wouldn't shouldn't assume that it includes corporations because of the many problematic implications that you talked about. Before. Speaking of partisanship, a lot of these rulings seemed somewhat predictable, if not in their their nuances, at least in the, the gist, uh, because they broke down along political lines mm -hmm. with the conservative justices voting one way and the liberal justices voting another. Were there any of these recent decisions that uh, sort of defied that easy characterization? Well, a couple of one, was, first of all, th this term had more unanimity among, uh, among the justices on the broad range of cases that they heard than, than ever before during the Roberts term. Mm -hmm. So it was actually much less ideological than one might have thought, except for these big cases. And even in the big cases, you, had a, you saw a couple of, of odd tweaks, like in the buffer zone case, it was a unanimous with regard to the judgment, but Roberts joined the liberal, the so-called liberals, mm -hmm. really the moderate liberals, to, to make it a, a narrow decision rather than a broad sweeping decision that the conservatives wanted. Let me ask you to prognosticate a tiny bit, 20 years from now or 30 years from now, which of these decisions will have the biggest impact uh, on the way ordinary men and women live their lives? I think Hobby Lobby. I think Hobby Lobby, which which looks like on the, on the surface is about contraception, contraception, it's really about gay rights, because what the court did today was to offer corporations that have religious shareholders the ability to be to be exempted from otherwise applicable law, the law that most religious that many I shouldn't say most many religious people, especially in, in the South, for example, want to be exempted from are laws that ban discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. So I think the real losers of today's Hobby Lobby case are, are the LGBT community. All right. Ken Greenfield, thank you a great deal for being here. It was a pleasure. Thanks, Adam.